Hey, how's it going guys? My name is Michael and I'm back for another reaction. Uh, today we're back for another Mr. Ballin video. I had noticed that he had uploaded a new video and then I was, I was gonna react to it but it literally uploaded like 50 minutes ago and I was like, uh, I'll wait like a day at least before I react to it because it's kind of, it kind of feels bad just to react to something that came out literally the day of. So I, I'll wait on that. I'm gonna go back to reacting to these Missing 401s because these are really interesting. And thereby, uh, I'm pretty sure David Plytus, I think that's his name. Yeah, David Plytus. And he's the one who made the books, made them, all that stuff. So I'm sure Mr. Ballin will explain all that. But yeah, let's get into it. I'm pretty, pretty excited. I, I like the last one. Every year, hundreds of people go missing inside of national parks all over North America. But of those hundreds of people every year. Oh, yeah. Also, uh, how many of you like the new layout? Because uh, I had a, a video I sent out that was about the new layout and if I should change to this. So tell me if you like it better than the old one. A few of them go missing under very strange circumstances. And a man named David Politis, who's a former police detective, has made it his mission to look into just the bizarre disappearances that are occurring all over North America in his series that's called Missing 411. <laughs> so there are thousands of these strange cases inside of Missing 411 that David Politis has poured tens of thousands of hours of research into. And he puts them into... Yeah, make sure... It'll be in the description. Make sure you check out his channel if you're more interested in this stuff. ...books into documentaries. And so there's really no, no shortage of strange cases to look at. But as I begin my own research into Missing 411 and, and learn about these different cases, I have been pulling groups of stories that stand out to me as being particularly interesting or just fascinating or just strange and i'm making videos to highlight those stories and so i've already done one video like this where i highlighted mm -hmm. five stories that i thought were particularly strange uh, you can find that in the description i left a link to that video if you want to check that out uh, and so today i'm going to be looking at another five cases from the missing 411 project that are just totally totally weird I'm ready i'm ready get into today's stories if you're interested in the strange dark and mysterious delivered in story format you've come to the right channel because i post three to four times a week all about the every time i hear that i think it's so insane that he posts that much dark and mysterious uh like i'm promising to deliver today and if that's your deal i would ask you to please gently uppercut the like button and then also subscribe to my channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of those three to four weekly uploads all right let's get into the story oh this is actually a different song well i don't trust it his last one is copyright his other one really takes the case i didn't know for just being strange all right let's get into family it that basically has two experiences that are somewhat connected. You're going to have to be the judge if they're connected. Oh, or okay. Very strange. So it's two different families? Is that what he said? You have a family that basically has two experiences. Oh, it's one family. Somewhat connected. You're going to have to be the judge okay. if they're connected or not. But very strange. I thought it was two On different October families. Of 2010, this family who decided to remain anonymous for the missing 411 story... They Makes go camping, sense. and it's a three-and-a-half-year-old boy, his older sister, and then the mom and the dad. And so they okay. go camping at Mount Shasta in California, which is a popular camping site. And the family loved to go camping there. And so they're all sitting around the campfire, kind of hanging out at the campsite. It's getting late in the evening, maybe 5, 6 o'clock. And the sister would say that she was looking at her brother, turned away for a second, and then looked back, and he was gone. And it was so sudden that she actually went to go look for him and couldn't find him. So she went and told her mom and her dad and they start calling for their son and they're looking all over their campsite and, and he's gone. Authorities show up and they launch a full search and for five hours they have hundreds of people scouring Dang. this area. Not only the campsite but the surrounding. That's actually really crazy because you would think if a little kid disappears within a few minutes. Like he, let's say let's say he disappeared five minutes. He would still be in an area where if you scream for him you would hear he would hear you. Like, he's not going to get far in five minutes, even if it's that long. But they said it was just a moment. So even, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds maybe they looked away, the little kid. You know, it's a little kid. It could have been, you know, looking away longer. But even still, they wouldn't have got that far. ...areas, and there's no trace... Very weird. 
five hours later, they find him laying in a thicket on a trail that has been searched multiple times. And it wasn't like hidden. The thicket was like right by the side of the trail. So if you've searched this trail, you've found hmm. this kid. So meaning he couldn't have been there during the search. He must have arrived and then they found him on this trail. Everybody was so happy that they found this kid and he wasn't physically harmed that no one really looked into the fact that it doesn't make any sense that he is here. How did he get here? Where did he go? Where has he been? No one thought about that. They were like, we got the kid back. We're all happy. The parents are happy. Everyone's ready to just move on. And so I'm going to be honest. I don't blame him. I think if I had my kid, if I lost my kid, I would just be so happy that he's back. I wouldn't even really care what happened. As long as nothing like happened to the kid, like he seems fine, I wouldn't care. Like he just seemed like he got lost and that's it. But that's, I'd probably ask a little bit, but I probably, no, actually, let me take that back. I don't blame him for doing it, but I probably would have asked. So the kid goes to the hospital. The doctor looks at the kid and says, you know what? He's fine. This is obviously a traumatic situation, but he's fine. You can take him home. And so the kid Good. goes home with his parents and pretty quickly the family went back to normal. They were obviously super grateful that they didn't lose their son. About three weeks after this whole ordeal, the boy... It took him that long to ask? ...with his grandmother, who he called Cat. Oh, never mind. It wasn't even his parents. About three weeks after this whole ordeal, the boy is with his grandmother, who he called Cappy. And he looks at Cappy and he goes, I don't like the other Cappy. And so his grandmother, the real Cappy, oh, she looks at oh, him. Oh, I hated that. Oh, that gave me chills. Oh, I hated that. I hated everything about what he just said. Oh, I hate when little kids say creepy stuff. Oh, it's like kryptonite. Oh. Other Cappy. Oh. And so his grandmother, the real Cappy, she looks at him and she was like, oh. Oh. Now, remember, this is a three and a half year old boy. Language I don't care. Not the best, okay? But he knows what he's saying. This story that he tells his grandmother he had previously told his father, but the father oh, so he did. had written it off as the ramblings of a three and a half year old. It wasn't mm. until the grandmother I could see told that. the father about the story that he was like, I've heard that story. And so the boy says, you know, while he was camping, he turned and he saw Cappy oh. waiting to, him to come with him. And so oh. he loves Cappy. This reminds me of like Wendigo stuff or yeah, oh. or Skinwalkers, whichever one it is that transforms into people. Oh. He goes with Cappy, and Cappy oh. leads him up a hill to a cave. Now, the whole time, the real Cappy, who wasn't there, she was not with them camping. She's thinking, oh my mm. gosh, someone who looks like me oh, abducted I hate this. this child. So she's listening, horrified. He said, you know, she brought me up to a cave. And when we got into the cave, he said there were spiders and purses, like women's purses. Purses? And he turned to look at Cappy. And he said that her head was glowing. And it was when he realized this is not Cappy. This is the other Cappy. And he said the other Cappy kept asking him questions, but he didn't know the answers. And so the other Cappy got frustrated and told him to leave and pushed him out of the cave. And he said that he left the cave and wound up in the thicket. And that's when he was found. And so when Cappy goes and tells the father and the father says, I've heard that story, they're like, that's so weird. Do you think there's any truth to this? Is there someone that looked like me, Cappy, that took the boy away? And so as Cappy and, and the boy's father are talking, Cappy feels compelled to share her own strange story about being on Mount Shasta. Because prior to this, oh, she has one? the family, I think, the way they were looking at what happened is the boy wandered off and he returned five hours later. But yeah, logically. Story being kind of corroborated by... You know, the father who heard the same story, Cappy's like, I got to share my story now because I don't know if it's connected, but oh, I God. had a very strange experience on Mount Shasta as well a year ago. You know, Here she we go. was camping a year earlier with her friend, and they go to a campsite on Mount Shasta, the same place where the boy disappeared and apparently saw the other Cappy. And so Cappy says that that night, they're sitting around the campfire and it's dark, and she notices a set of eyes in the woods. That were All right, glowing, pretty normal. Glowing red pretty normal. Eyes, she says. And, Ooh, you know, a little less normal. Friend, they go I wasn't expecting red. Camping all the time. And so they know there could be predators and animals mm -hmm. all over the place. And so they grab their flashlights and they shine in the direction of, of the eyes. And they kind of, the eyes dart away and they don't think anything of it. Over the course of the night, the eyes would keep showing up all around them. And every time they'd shine a light in their direction, 
they would vanish. Kathy and her friend are unable to get the light on this thing. So they don't know what it is. And so they're, they're very uneasy about it. But they decide, you know what? We're psyching ourselves out. It's just an animal that, that's interested in us. And so they hope go they have an RV. And they sleep in their own. She slept in a tent and he slept <sighs> in a camper. And oh. they go to bed. And the next morning, Kathy wakes up and she's laying on the dirt outside of her tent. And immediately she has pain in the back of her neck. And so she reaches back and she grabs her neck and she can feel there's a cut on the back of her neck. She doesn't know what it is and she looks up and her friend is on the ground outside of his camper face down as well. And so she gets up, she feels horrible, like sick, like violently sick in fact. Sounds like alien abduction stuff. And so she gets up, she feels horrible, like sick, like violently sick in fact. And she kind of staggers away over to her friend who is laying there and she can see too that he's got a mark on his neck and he gets up and he's like what happened oh, and they assumed so that they had been bitten by you know a poisonous spider that's actually what they believed because it was a little puncture wound on both of oh their necks, and okay i thought caused them to be sick. he said he said cut i thought he meant like an actual like slice not a puncture wound because it was a little puncture wound on both of their necks and that it had caused them to be sick and delirious they'd wandered out of their being vampire in their tent and they'd wound up on the ground but now, as Cappy is retelling the story, she was like, I don't know how to connect that experience with what happened to the boy, but I just, I can't help but feel like something weird's happening on Mount Shasta. And it would turn out that, you know, maybe they weren't wrong because Mount Shasta is like a hotspot for missing 411 strange disappearances. And in fact, our next story is another Mount Shasta case. In 1999, Carl- Oh, that was, that was the end. Oh, that that's a banger of a first story. I can't wait for this next story. That first story was so good. Is another Mount Shasta case. In 1999, Carl Landers was a very experienced hiker, climber, who whose passion in life was on the weekends or any chance he got was to go hiking and climbing and camping. That was just what he did. He was in great shape. He was enjoying retirement. That was, his, that was his happy place, was being on a mountain somewhere in California, hiking around. And he had two very close friends that he would go hiking with just about every chance he could. In 1999, in the summer, Carl decides he wants to summit Mount Shasta. And it's something he had attempted to do before, and he had been unsuccessful, and this time he was going to do it. And so Mount Shasta, it's, it's high enough, it's about 14,000 feet, that uh, it's not uncommon That's pretty for people to stop at this point called... Uh, Lake Helen, where, you know, hikers can adjust to the altitude because it's it's certainly possible to get sick from being at altitude if you don't adjust to it or if your body doesn't respond well to it. And so their plan was get to Lake Helen, camp out for the night, and then summit the next day. So they head up in May of 1999, the three of them, they get to Lake Helen and they set up their camp for the night. It was clear that Carl already had some sort of altitude sickness because by the time they reach Lake Helen, mm. he's weak, he's sick, and he figures, I'm going to try to sleep it off tonight. Uh, I'll see how I feel in the morning. And so all night, Carl is just super sick. It's a horrible night for him. And so early the next morning, Carl, he's a real stubborn guy and he really wanted to climb Mount Shasta. He says to his two friends, hey, look, I'm just going to get a head start here. I've been up basically all night. I'm going to just get up the last stretch here Ooh. and up this mountain and then come back down. Bad choice, and, bad and choice. Be done with it. And so his two friends, they didn't like the idea of, of yeah. splitting up, but Carl's an experienced guy. And, I mean, he's only covering a distance of maybe 650 feet. That's so a long way. some epic distance he's covering. It's basically like a day hike. So Carl leaves on... That's a long distance. I hope they tried to convince him a bit better than that. Like, they actually were like, hey, man, we really aren't comfortable. Even if you want to go, could you at least wait a little bit? Let us go with you. Something along those lines, because that's so bad. I, Man, I hope they did try to convince him. This is not some epic distance he's covering. It's basically like a day hike. So Carl leaves on his own. He leaves his backpack at the campsite, and his two friends would watch him as he kind of bent around the mountain and went up towards the summit, and that would be the last time they ever saw him. The two friends would attempt to uh, summit as well, about 30 minutes later. One of them apparently had gotten sick overnight and said, look, I, I can't do this, and, and he stays at the camp. He's like, I'll be here. You know, we've already split up from Carl. Why don't you also go on your own, summit yourself, and, and I'll be here. I'll wait for Carl, I'll wait for you. The friend that does make the summit 
He goes up, he follows the same trail, the short distance up to the summit, gets to the summit, and he hasn't seen Carl. He's not shocked. It is a little strange that they wouldn't have passed on the way, but he's thinking, you know, anything could happen. Maybe he sat down somewhere, I don't know what it is, and then comes back down expecting to see Carl back at the campsite. So he gets back to the campsite at Lake Helen where the other sick friend had not left, he was still there, and he says, hey, has Carl come back? And the friend's like, no. No, didn't you see him on the way up? Isn't I mean, did you mm -hmm. laugh at him? Like, what's he doing up there? Oh, that's so bad. He's like, no, I, I went up. I didn't see him on the way up. I didn't see him at the summit. And I didn't see him on the way down. And they're thinking to themselves, like, thinking about the trail itself. It's incredibly open. There's, there's almost nowhere to, like, fall. There's no crevasse. There's no sheer cliff. You know, there's almost... You know, I was, I was in, thinking in my mind, I was like, I bet you fell into, like, a crevasse, essentially like an ice cave but this is just mountainous range there isn't any way to fall into anything he could have it was it looked like it was no snowy way. in the pictures Small. but there's no crevasse there's no sheer cliff you know there's almost well, no uh vegetation really to uh, there's some you. sheer cliffs there it just didn't make any sense that you could vanish a huge search is launched they never found anything there was also 50 to 100 people in the area that day and nobody knew where he went no one saw him no one had any idea what happened to him they interviewed everybody there no one knows what happened to carl the only clue that we have of carl is the backpack that he <laughs> left at lake helen before he made the summit run other than that for 20 years we have no clue wow. what happened to him none and so this next story is really it's crazy. crazy one of the strange phenomena oh. that you get inside of these missing 411 stories is you have people that go missing really suddenly. Like as if they were pulled away at high speed and just ripped off the face of the mountain. Oh. This story is one of those stories. In 2010, Eric Lewis was 57 years old. He was an... I don't want to be creeped out, so I'm, I'm pretty baby when it comes to scary stuff. That's why I don't play any scary games. I don't watch any scary movies. Why are you running? I can deal with scary stories, and that's about as far as I can go. Like, some scary videos I can deal with, but, like, I'm such a big baby when it comes to them. And I don't know why. I'm just, that's how I am. And this story is one of those stories. In 2010, Eric Lewis was 57 years old. He was an extremely experienced mountain climber. And he had two very close friends that were also very experienced mountain climbers. And they decided that they wanted to go hike Mount Rainier in Washington State, which is a huge mountain. That's like the same thing, aside from a different mountain. Climb ...that was fairly technical and fairly dangerous, and it required the three of them to be tethered together on the same cable. And so Ooh. as they're making this ascent of Mount Rainier, you have friend one in the front, friend, mm -hmm. friend two in the middle, and oh, then Eric Lewis is the third guy on, on the line <gasps> all the way down. And so the way it worked is the first climber, friend number one, if he wanted to rest, the other two climbers would keep climbing up to his position and take a rest with him. So he was kind of in charge of setting the cadence of how quickly they were going to climb this mountain. And so over the course of the day, the first climber would stop periodically, and then the second climber and Eric would make their way up and, and wait and relax. All day that was happening. And then one time they come to a stop, and there's been nothing weird happening. Nothing's happened to this point. Everything feels very normal. The first guy stops. The second climber gets up to him, and then Eric doesn't show up. And so they pull on the, on the line, and it's very light. And they pull it up and the rope has been cut like eric's gone and they're like okay only in an emergency would you cut the line and so they just start immediately descending because they're like well it just snowed there's it would be very easy to track his footsteps if he cut the line he must have had a reason let's follow his footsteps to wherever he went but the only footsteps on the mountain were the ones walking up attached to the rope basically eric had been walking up leaving footprints right behind the other two and then the footprints just stopped. There aren't footprints that go back down. It was like he was pulled off of the mountain. And so they start walking down, thinking they're going to run into him, but they don't. Like, the only possible answer is, like, I don't know this, but there had to have been, a, like, a little cave or something. Like, that just, that one's actually baffling. Pulled off of the mountain. And so they start walking down, thinking they're going to run into him, but they don't. The weather gets bad enough that they ultimately abandon the hike. They go down, and they're like, geez. They tell the authorities, and they're looking everywhere, and they can't find him. And then they discover this creepy cave that's like 200 feet down and away from where they were hiking. 
that would have been very hard to get to. Inside of this ice cave is Eric's gear, but no Eric. And they've never found Eric's body. But for that gear to get into the cave, it wasn't just, you know, hanging on the edge. It was inside the cave. But there was no footprints leading to the cave. There was no footprints anywhere. It was just like inexplicably, Eric's gear winds up deep inside an ice cave 200 feet away. And uh, I... Eric's body was never recovered. And no one has any idea what happened to him. So the last story is actually really two distinct stories, but they okay. together make up a particular phenomenon that occurs inside some of these missing 411 cases. And that's when some creature takes a child and actually protects them. In 1868, okay. a three-year-old girl vanished abruptly from her father's camp in northern Michigan. The father noticed the girl was gone, you know, in hysterics. He enlists the help of a couple professional hunters that were there with him. They go off looking for this girl. And after a couple of hours of looking, they start to hear what sounds like her voice. And she doesn't sound particularly distraught, but it's definitely a child's voice. And so they kind of cut through this big thicket and out burst this massive bear looking thing that runs away from them. And they didn't, they didn't shoot it or anything. They just saw this huge animal run away and they're thinking the worst because they're hearing this child and now they're seeing this huge animal that looks like a bear running away. And, you know, they kind of, they go through the thicket and they find this girl who's totally unharmed, who was in this kind of clearing within the thicket where clearly this, this bear creature had been with her. And, you know, the father is elated. He scoops up the child and the child seems unhurt. And he asks her like, where have you been? What happened? And she says, oh, Mr. Wolf took me here. And Mr. Wolf was feeding me berries, and Mr. Wolf was playing with me. Maybe it was a bear or a wolf or something, but some animal had taken her, brought her into a thicket, and had not harmed her. And so the other instance occurred in 1955, when a family that was made up of mother, father, and their eight kids were staying in this camp in Dang. Montana. And they had all these different tents set up for all their kids. And uh, some of the older kids were staying in one of the tents, with their two-year-old sister, Ida May, while the parents were working and the kids were doing whatever they were doing. And so these older kids are sitting deep inside the tent and near the entrance to the tent is where Ida May, the two-year-old, is sitting. And the tent is open, like the flap is open to the tent. And as they're sitting there, the older kids would later say that a bear wandered past, reached in, grabbed Ida May, and scooped her up into its arms. Now, a bear does not do this with its arm. Yeah, I was about to say that like they have a stiff arm, don't they? The bear they? was holding Ida like this and ran away on three legs instead of four. And so the kids are freaked out because they just oh, saw that's a bear creepy. take their two-year-old away. They're basically hysterical. They sprint up to their mom and dad. They tell them what happened. And the parents just have no idea how to react to this. They obviously get in touch with authorities. They launch the search. And as they're doing the search, you know, police are asking the kids, like, describe to us again what you saw. And they're like, it was a bear that was like holding our sister like this. And they were like, we've got to be more descriptive because bears can't do that. Was it a person? Was it a hairy person? And the police just didn't buy that it was a bear. Mm. And so two days go by and they haven't found this child. And so the family obviously is thinking the worst. They're absolutely grief stricken. And then one of the searchers finds the girl and they find her about 300 yards away from the camp she was inside of a very intentionally built structure. It was like a crudely built fort uh, right against the riverbed. And inside it was like a den and she was in there and she was totally unharmed and she was perfectly fine. And they, they take her out and they ask her like, you know, what happened? And she's two, but she says, oh, she ain't gonna tell Mr. Say Bear much. fed me berries. Mr. Bear kept me here. Mr. Bear cuddled me. That's all we have. We don't know what this creature was, what bear is mm -hmm. able to pull its arm in like this, but she felt totally unthreatened by it. And to this day, we don't really know if that was a bear or something else, but whatever it was, it didn't harm Ida and Ida never felt threatened by it. These stories are just a fraction of the literal thousands of strange cases that David Politis covers in his Missing 411 project. So if you enjoyed this video and you might wanna see more content just like this, I would encourage you to gently uppercut the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of my three to four weekly uploads of All right, that was such a great video. And as always, I'll have the links to David Politis and Mr. Ballin's channel. Make sure you check out both of them. They do great work. This 
the first story was so chilling. I, I got goosebumps instantly. It was crazy. But this was a really good video. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll catch you guys later. Bye.